Amen. We're in a series right now that is titled, You Asked For It, and it is titled that because we are talking about things that you have told us that you are struggling with as we go through this pandemic and everything else that has been going on in our world during that pandemic. It's not like we've been dealing with one thing. We've had to deal with a number of things in this season, and I think it has cause most, maybe all of us, to struggle in some way or another. And so we're talking to you about those things that you said you've struggled with the most. Anxiety was at the top of the list. And so in week one, we talked about what to do when anxiety attacks. And if you weren't here, I strongly encourage you to go back and listen to that, whether you listen to it on the lap, on the lap, on the app, or online, you can sit on someone's lap if you want to while you're doing it, I don't care. Might be a little distracting, but anyway, I would encourage you to make sure that you go back and listen to that. And then last week, we began talk to, talking to you about marriage and family because that was what was next on the list. People have said, we're struggling in our marriage and in our family. I think a lot of people are. And I want you to know that you know, if you think, well, I'm not married, I don't have a family, so this is really not applicable to me, it is, because I don't care whether it's marriage and family or any other relationship that you have, uh, these are principles that will help you in those relationships be more successful, and relationships are a huge part of our life, whether it's our relationship with God, our relationship with our spouse, our family members, our uh, church family, whatever, Really, our lives revolve around uh, relationships. When those relationships are working, life can be so good. But whenever we're struggling in a relationship, it can make our life uh, not so good. And sometimes it can actually make our life uh, almost like hell on earth. And so we want to keep our relationships strong and uh, doing well. And we talked about how... Uh, you know, actually, the title of the message is "How to Have a Marriage That Thrives in Difficult Times," and uh, that's the kind of marriage I think we all want. And we've said that a lot of couples are struggling to get along in this crazy season that we're in. And I gave you just a few of the stats that I found that uh, you know indicate that uh, those being that many couples are stressed out. A lot of couples are, and often they're taking that stress out on each other. We do that, don't we, sometimes? Get stressed out, and we take it out on the people around us that we love the most. Doesn't make sense, does it? And then sadly, some have become abusive. You always hate to hear that. You hate to hear any time there's abuse involved. If that's where yours is evolving into or has already evolved into, get help. Don't just, you know, don't just try to work through that on your own. Get you some help. Talk with someone uh, domestic violence is on the rise, and it's not up just a little bit, it's up a whole lot. And then many have predicted that there's going to be a surge in divorces once the pandemic begins to subside. Not a lot of places to go right now, I guess, but once the pandemic is over, more options than, you know, a spouse is planning on exiting, whether the other spouse knows it or not. And so we don't want you to be a part of those stats. We want you Again, to have strong marriages, strong families. So how do we deal with and rise above the challenges that we're facing in our homes right now? How can our marriages, how can our families be marriages and families that thrive in a difficult season like this? And I use the word thrive because I had thought about using the word survive and it didn't feel right. I'm a word guy. I love words. So uh, I went to, uh, actually I Googled it. That's my dictionary now. and looked up the definition for the word survive. And it means to continue to live or exist, especially in spite of danger or hardship. So you survived the danger or hardship, which is good, which means it may, you made it through it. And see, I think there's a lot of marriages that, you know, they'll make it through it. But that's really all they'll do is they'll just make it through it. And, uh, you know, might, might have a lot of rocky places uh, might have a lot of iffy times, but they'll make it through it. I don't believe that's God's will at all. I really do believe it's God's will that we have marriages that thrive. The word thrive means to grow or to develop well or vigorously. So I'm telling you that your marriage can actually grow and develop while you're going through this pandemic. 
Because there's something about difficult times that reveal where we have shortcomings anyway, where we have areas that we need to be addressing in our lives in, you know, in the first place. And if we did, our marriages would be better, our families would be better. And so we kind of can't get away from those things right now. God uses those challenging times to bring that to the forefront so that he can help us deal with it. And if when we deal with those things in those negative times, it's amazing how it changes us, but it also changes our world, changes our marriage, changes our family, and we do better moving forward. So I believe you can have a marriage that does even better because you went through the pandemic of 2020. What a, what a powerful thing to be able to say. Our marriage got stronger during the pandemic. Wouldn't that be better than saying we got divorced because of, yeah, yeah, absolutely, or anything in between that. So the first thing that we talked about, if you want to have a marriage that thrives in difficult times, you need to be aware. And we talked about being aware of God's presence and how the Bible says blessed are the people who walk in the light of God's presence. They're aware of God's presence. And they know that he's there for them and that he never leaves them and forsakes them. And it goes on and says, because you're their glory and their strength. He's, only our, he's our glory and strength all the time. But you're only going to take advantage of his glory and strength when you're aware of him. If you forget about him, you're not thinking about him, uh, aware of his presence, you're not going to be walking in the strength that he provides for you. Then we talked about being aware of the enemy. The enemy loves taking advantage of difficult circumstances like this, get us at odds with each other. And, uh, you know, he, so Peter says, be sober, be vigilant when you're going through life, especially difficult times, because your adversary, the devil, is looking for someone to devour. He can't just devour anyone. He has to find a weak person or a weakness in a person that he can take advantage of in order to kill, to steal, to destroy. Be aware of your spouse. Be aware of how your spouse is doing right now because all of us have moments through a difficult season like this, especially when it goes on as long, maybe moments. And so we need to be mindful. We need to be aware of how our spouse is doing. And just ask them, are you okay? You know, sometimes whenever you can tell that they're struggling and be there for them in those moments. Be aware of your children. Just because your children are at home right now doesn't mean they're safe. Your home may or may not still be a safe place because of the Internet, because of the access your kids have to uh, all of the things that are on the Internet. Uh, even though your kids may be at home, uh, it may not be safe. Be aware. What are your children doing and uh, how much time they're spending on uh, you know, their smartphones, their iPads, whatever, the, whatever it is that they're on, who they're in communication with, whatever the case may be. Uh, be. Be like Ronald Reagan was with uh, Russia. I know you want to trust your kids, but you need to have Ronald Reagan's uh, mindset, trust but verify. Come on. I trust them, but I'm going to verify. We're going to make sure you're doing what you need to be doing. Remember, they're just kids. Know the state of your flock. Know how your kids are doing. Put your heart into caring for them. And then be aware of yourself, and that's so very vitally important. And Paul tell, told Timothy that he needed to keep a close watch on himself, and in doing so, he would not only save himself, but he would also save others. There's something about, if I keep myself strong and where I need to be with the Lord, it saves me, obviously, but I'm also able to help save others. I'm also able to help keep others encouraged and keep them challenged, too. So, Dad, Mom, keep yourself. Make sure you're doing well right now in this difficult time. The second thing we talked about was being loving, being loving, and not that doesn't just mean telling someone you love them, that's great, but loving actually means to show someone love and to show them great care, and I think we're very good at telling, we're not always as good at showing, and we think our spouse should know we love them, but yet we should be showing that we love them, and that's not always just in a caress or a, you know, a moment where you're very passionate, that's, you know, that's all great, that's all good, I, I love that for sure, but Paul told us what being loving looks like in 1 Corinthians 13. He said, love is patient. How patient are you being with your wife, with your children, with your husband, your children right now in this pandemic? Love is kind. Love is kind. Does not envy, doesn't boast, not proud, doesn't dishonor others, doesn't say dishonoring things. Is not self-seeking, just thinking about himself, herself. Not easily angered, keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. 
always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails, never quits on the other person. So if I'm being loving right now in my marriage, how many know there's a whole lot of things I'm doing in that being loving? Isn't that right? And that will, that will keep me busy in my relationship with my wife and keep me, I think that's a good checklist that I need to go through on a weekly basis to make sure that I'm actually doing that, all right? The third B is be supportive, be supportive. The word supportive means to be helpful, to be caring, encouraging, understanding, reassuring, and sympathetic. And I know this doesn't sound real spiritual, but can I tell you, I've never taught anything that is any more spiritual than what I'm teaching right now. It just happens to be very, very practical at the same time. Everything I'm talking to you about has scriptural basis. In fact, it's all stuff that we ought to be doing all the time. And we want to hear the spiritual stuff that we think is spiritual, but we're not living the stuff that the Bible really teaches us to do and, and being the people that God tells us we need to be because if we were, our marriages would be better. Our families would be stronger. Come on. Our lives would be different if we would just be these things that seem so, you know, duh, so, yeah, matter of fact, but we just aren't always that great at doing them. One of the most often made complaints in marriages that I've heard personally as a pastor during this season is that one spouse or parent feels like they're doing more than their fair share of everything that's going on in the house right now, and more is going on in our home, working at home, schooling from home. So much is going on at home. And so their spouse feels like they're not being very, they don't feel like their spouse is being very understanding, very encouraging, very helpful, very supportive. And so I just want to remind you of what Peter tells us about marriage in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. He says that a man and a woman are heirs together in the grace of life. What that very simply means is that the marriage that we are, it's an equal partnership. It's not big I, little you. It's an equal partnership. Come on, how many know we are, we are really in this together? Isn't that right? And uh, he is reminding uh, the, the believers in that day of that. It's, you know, and he says that you need, husbands need to be aware of the fact that their wife, they need to treat their wife as though she's the weaker vessel. If I think something's weaker, I'm ca- more careful with it. I'm more tender with it. Uh, I'm more intentional with it if I think it's weaker. It doesn't say she is weaker, but it says to treat her that way. Your wife might be very strong, but as a husband, you should still treat her as the weaker vessel. And man, you ain't going to get anything but good out of that. I'm just going to tell you right now. Amen. And uh, so again, uh, we're, we're supposed to be there for each other. We're supposed to be very helpful each, of each other as we uh, are working out our marriage relationship. And he says that when we don't appreciate each other's roles and we're not understanding of each other's roles and as supportive as we ought to be, then things start happening in our marriage that uh, cause our prayers to be hindered. In other words, we get at odds with each other. And when we're at odds with each other, would you agree with me? It's hard to have the peace of God in your home. It's hard for God to move in your marriage, in your family, when you're at odds with your spouse. So he says, you know, be mindful of each other. Support one another through this deal. And don't give place to the devil by getting at odds with each other so God can move in your life. So this pandemic, I think, has created... Uh, Obviously, more of a load for many of us, as I said, working from home, schooling from home, whatever else it is you're doing from home. And anytime you add uh, to the load of anything, you create stress. And so sharing obviously lightens the load in any relationship. And whether you're at church, uh, at work, uh, you know, at, at home for sure, sharing lightens the load. Another verse that we use, and we usually use it in reference to the rest of the body. But can I tell you, if these things aren't working at home, they're probably not working anywhere else anyway. And Paul told uh, the uh, church at Galatia, Galatians 6, chapter 2, or, or chapter 6, verse 2, share each other's burdens, share each other's burdens, and in this way obey the law of Christ. If there's anywhere we ought to be sharing each other's burdens, it's at home. We're mindful of what each other is going through. We're in this together and we're sharing the load. And it's absolutely amazing 
what can be accomplished when we are, when we're supportive of one another. One can put a thousand to flight, two can put ten thousand. Can I tell you, whenever you're supportive of one another, you can do so much more, accomplish so much more. You got a solid front in the face of the kids, isn't that right? And I mean, you just become, uh, you know, unconquerable uh, whenever you are. Uh, supportive of, of each other and working together. I didn't talk about this in the first service. went a little different direction. Uh, but it was such a huge concept that I chose to not put it into my notes. But, you know, the Bible talks about uh, submission. We have such a religious idea of what submission is. And I can't go there for the sake of time. But I actually found out through studying this that being supportive is actually a huge part of being submissive. And by the way, Guys who want to, you know, yeah, the wife is supposed to submit herself to her husband. You're right, but that's only one verse. There's another one right before it that says husbands and wives are to submit to one another. Did you know that? Submit to one another. And so when we submit to one another, basically what that means is that we come under one another. We, we are there as a support to each other. Come on. We're helping each other. Wow, what would happen if we just submitted to one another in life? We were there to, to uplift the other. Come on, to encourage one another. Man, you, you, the devil would have no way into our homes, would he? So everybody say, be supportive. All right? The next one is be consistent. And really, this has to do with our routine more than anything. Now, I just chose the word consistent because I thought be routine didn't sound right. So I said, be consistent. I was looking for somebody, some way in the Bible to show you the importance of being consistent, of keeping a routine. Would you agree with me that this pandemic, if it's done anything, it's messed up our normal routines? Many of us are still not back in our routine at all. And uh, so I thought about who, you know, who kept their routine no matter what. And I thought of Daniel. His is different. He's not in a pandemic. He's, there's, a, there's a decree gone out that you can't pray. And uh, Daniel, to any other God, and uh, other than Nebuchadnezzar's God, I guess. And so Daniel hears that decree in verse, uh, chapter 6, verse 10. It says, but when Daniel learned that, he, that the law had been signed, he went home, knelt down as usual in his upstairs room with its windows open <laughs> towards Jerusalem, and he prayed three times a day, just as he had always done, just as his routine was giving thanks to his God. So I thought about how Daniel didn't let anything take him out of, his, out of his routine. And routines are so very important, whether you realize it or not. How many of you would agree with me that brushing your teeth is a good routine? How many, are, how many of you are glad everybody else has that routine, that habit? How about showering, first thing in the morning? How many think that's a good routine? Yeah. How about getting up in the morning and spending time before your spouse gets up or just maybe, you know, your own private time somewhere. You've got every day you have this time set aside where you spend a little bit of time with the Lord and a little bit of time in his word. How many of you think that's a good routine? All right. Routines are good. Routines important. They keep us doing the simple things that matter and they keep us consistent. The enemy loves to take us out of our consistency to get us out of our good habits because then he can uh, help us develop some very bad ones. And I think that might could happen if it hasn't already happened in many people's lives through this pandemic. When you get out of routine, everything gets thrown off just a bit. Consistency is lost. Focus is lost. Things go undone. And as I just said, bad habits develop. Order is lost. And order is so huge in all of our lives, in all of our marriages, in all of our homes, whether we realize it or not. Order is a huge, it's the first thing God did when he created the earth was he set everything in order. You can't have life and life more abundantly if there's disorder in your world. And we can make it big disorder, but it can be little disorders that start arising and start taking you out of the routine of very good and very healthy and spiritually healthy things that you would be doing otherwise. Amen? So you need to maintain a routine in the pandemic. And if, you, if you've gotten out of one, then just reestablish it. And I read, uh, I thought this was good. One person said, just because you're working and studying from home doesn't mean that you should treat every day like a Saturday now. <laughs> I thought, wow. And off goes my pajamas and my sweats and 
Got to get back in my regular drawers, uh, my regular jeans, and come on. And uh, you should still rise. This is a secular person saying this. You should still rise at a decent hour and go about your day. I think that's good advice. Stay in your routine. Don't let this, don't let the enemy take advantage of the, of the pandemic uh, and get you out of re- your routine. St- establish a routine for your kids, a regular routine. And, you know, a lot of kids, man, they're clear out of their routine. School's not the same. Home's not the same. Dad and mom are both home. Dad and mom don't want to have to fool with the kids all the time. It, you know, you guys go in your room, play, whatever. I'm not, you know, I don't know. I'm just saying I can see how that could happen. And out of routine. It's not good for you. It's not good for your kids. not a healthy environment for your home. Get your kids back in a routine. Get them up. My, listen, I don't have any kids at home. So what I am referencing right now is what I know that all three of my adult kids who are married and all have kids have done, and they're, they're all, I, they've done a good job parenting through this. Every one of my kids' families have an established routine. The kids don't sleep and lay in bed all day long. They get up. They do their school. They, ha- they exercise. They all have chores. They have a limited amount of time that they are able to be on their screens and do and stuff like that. I mean, they are keeping a sense of order, a sense of routine in their home. How many think that's good? I think that's good for anyone. How about sitting down and having meals together? We always talked about before how we never got the chance to do that. Everybody's going in different directions. We ain't going in different directions right now. Yeah, so we don't have a reason for why we're not sitting down at the table with a family. In fact, we might could do that now, breakfast, lunch, and dinner in some cases. So have a routine. Everybody say have a routine. I got to hurry. Number five, be proactive. Be proactive. This is a biggie. This is a biggie for me, pandemic or not. And when I talk about being proactive, the word proactive means acting in anticipation of future problems. I see a problem coming, so I act in response to that problem I see coming. Taking action before problems develop. I see a problem, something that could turn into a problem, I take action before it develops. Controlling a situation, I love this definition. By causing something to happen rather than waiting to respond to it after it has happened. I'd rather cause something to happen than let something happen any day. If you let life happen, it usually is a mess. If you cause it to happen, it's your decision what comes of it. Isn't that right? And so I foresee a problem or I see a problem already arising and I'm proactive. I don't just ignore it. I don't wait till it gets big and then finally I'm going to do something about it. I cut it off at the pass before it gets big. My staff will tell you I'm very proactive. When we sit in staff meetings and talk about things that are happening, if there's a hint of something that's a little off, I'll say, you know what, maybe you want to have a conversation right now. Maybe you want to, you know, have you thought about doing this? What am I, could they let it go? They could let it go, but it's a problem. And problems don't tend to go away. And they don't tend to stay the same size. They tend to get worse the longer they go on unaddressed. So let's cut these things off the pass, at the past, and let's deal with them now while they're smaller. Amen? See your problem with a kid that's isolating himself. Starts it right. Don't wait till he's done it for a month. Hey, I noticed, Johnny, you haven't been around for a while. Well, if you see it, you know, whatever. Attitude going south. You set that kid down, talk to him, you know. You see a problem arise, you are proactive. You control the circumstance by dealing with the issue before it turns into a problem and then respond to it. I think very often uh, we have the tendency to wait until we're upset, we're frustrated, and the complaint has built up, and then we we finally address the issue when we're upset and angry. And obviously, you're not even in a good emotional state to deal with the problem then. It's better to deal with it before, uh, again, you've gotten angry and so frustrated with it, and you're just going to deal with it so much better. So it's better to be proactive and get ahead of things than to let resentment build up and then explode in a moment when you're struggling and you get upset, as I said. And sometimes it's just a conversation. Being proactive, I think, more often than not, you know, the problem can be solved just through a conversation, just talking about it. Hey, what's up? And uh, it's amazing how much you can fix, how much you can turn around, how much you can solve by just having a simple conversation. Isn't that right? So I think we really need to be very proactive at making sure we're keeping lines of communication open. And listen, 
Spouses, your husband, your wife is not a mind reader. So don't expect them to know what you're thinking or necessarily what you're struggling with. Talk to them about it. Let them know uh, what it is that you're dealing with. In James chapter 1, verses 19 through 20, James says, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. By the way, this is not just good to practice at church and out in the world. This is very good to practice at home. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. I like to listen a little and speak a lot. Why? Because I know where you're going, and let's solve this. I don't want to sit here and listen to all the details. I I hate details. So I've had to practice this. I've had to put this into practice. Quick to hear. In other words, I listen. I'll listen to what you're saying. Now, I may still talk to you and help you solve, you know, have you thought about this, but I'm first going to listen. Do you know how much we just want someone to listen to us? We don't want someone just fixing us all the time. We want to know that someone actually cares enough to listen. And then in a moment where you think they're ready, just say, can I help you with that? Can I help you with this? Have you thought about this? What if we did this? But be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Don't get angry. I get so sick of dealing with these problems. Really? Well, then just ignore them. That'll cause them to go away. They'll all solve themselves, sir, ma'am. The very attitude, I'm sick of dealing with these problems. Life is full of problems. In this world, you will have problems. Acknowledge that problems are going to be consistent. You got, if you're married, you're going to have problems. If you've got kids, you're going to have a lot of problems. Right? We're problem solvers. Everybody say that with me. I'm a problem solver. Yeah. Pastor, don't you get sick of problems? I'm a, they're part of life. If I approach them that way, I'm already working from a negative. Be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. What's up? Let's, let's deal with this before we're, we're in this together. Amen. This is good preaching, Pastor Neil. Thank you. Thank you. Sad when I have to <laughs> amen my own preaching. Number six, be positive. Be positive. I talk a lot about attitude, but I don't think there's anything more important in your life than your attitude. I don't think anything has more to do with your success in life than your attitude. And I always get spiritual people who will say, well, what about Jesus? You can know Jesus and have a bad attitude and still fail miserably in life. How many of you know a lot of people who know Jesus and they're not successful in life because they got a nasty attitude or a negative attitude? And we, you, know, you know where negative attitudes show up the most? Home. We're freer there than we are anywhere. My wife and I, you know, we've had these conversations. Would, would you be talking to so-and-so like that? No, but you ain't so-and-so. You know, that was a long time ago. She don't talk to me like that anymore. I caught myself, I honestly did, I caught myself talking to my daughter-in-law, because I was, John and Britt worked here, and God convicted me. I, I, Brittany and I have always gotten along crazy well. We've had, we've had struggles, but we've always gotten along really well. And I love her like a daughter. And I've always been very kind to her, always very gracious, always, you know, very caring. And then I would go home, and I could be sharp with Sheila. Now, see, that sounds bad when I say that. I know how bad that sounds, but yet we do that kind of stuff all the time. I didn't go home with Brittany every night. If I would went home with her every night, I might not have been so nice all the time. But I live with my wife, and we've been together 45 years, so we take privileges with each other that we should never take. And talking hateful to each other is one that you can easily digress into, especially when you're a little frustrated, being sharp, right? 
I know. I'm the only one who does it. So just look at me in that judgmental tone of voice. Mask on, mask off. I can still tell you're judging me right now. All right? When we're in a difficult season, nothing makes it any harder than a negative attitude. I mean, it's already hard, but a negative attitude makes it even harder. Being negative makes everything more difficult. Being negative makes it harder on everyone, makes it harder on you if you're the negative person, but it also makes it harder on everybody around you because you're being so negative. You complicate everything by being negative. Being negative wears on the people who are around us. I hate being around negative people. I mean, they just absolutely take the air out of the room. You know what I'm talking about? You can be so excited and a negative person can rain on even the best of parades, right? How many of you have people that you know that when they walk in the room, they light up the room? How many of you know people that when they walk out of the room, the room gets brighter? <laughs> Hopefully that's not your spouse. We got to be positive. So I says, well, I'm just a negative person. I've always been a negative person. Well, you, you might have always been, but you don't have to always be. And you know what? Did you know that your attitude is actually one of the very first things you're supposed to go to work on after you get saved? In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 23, now listen to this. He says, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self. And he's going to tell you what putting off your old self means. Oh, just all those sinful ways. Yeah, for sure. But that's not what he's going to mention. To put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires or its negative attitudes even. To be made new in the attitude of your mind. How do I put off my old self? Be made new in the attitude of my mind. And to put on the new, the new self, which created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So my attitude should be always be becoming more and more like the attitude that I see in Christ. You're never going to see a bad attitude in Jesus. He's always going to have a very faith-filled, positive, if you want to call it that, attitude. Isn't that right? Can I tell you nothing is going to impact how you go through this pandemic any more than your attitude, your disposition. Yeah. Nothing is going to determine how God's able to move more than your attitude while you're going. Keep a good attitude going through the pandemic. It's amazing how God can just keep moving and working in your life. Isn't that right? Well, look at everything that's happened to us. I love what Chuck Swindoll says. said it years ago. Life is 10% what happens to you and 90% how you respond. There are people who are going through exactly what you're going through right now, and yet they're responding with a good attitude, and things are turning out. They're, they're living different. They're, they're, they're not down. They're not sad. They're not fussing and fighting at home. And it's a big part of it is they just got a different attitude. Everybody say, be positive. And you know what I'm positive of? I am running out of time. All right. So everybody, everybody say it with me. Keep a good attitude. And I've already told you, attitude's your choice before, so I don't, you know, nobody forces your attitude on you. You're the one who chooses it. I didn't talk about these things in the first service, but I'm going to put them in this service, and that people who were here first service can go back and watch them online. But let me give you these last ones real quickly, just so, you know, I can move on to something else next time. All right, the next one is be forgiving. Everybody say, be forgiving. Forgiveness plays such a huge role in keeping our relationships healthy and strong, doesn't it? I mean, the moment we start, you know, we get offended and we get in strife with each other and we start just giving place to that in our home, man, things digress quickly. And Jesus taught us to be crazy forgiving, didn't he? Remember when Peter said, you know, if, if my brother sins against me, you know, seven times, how many times should I forgive him? Seven times. Remember that? He thought he was being magnanimous. He thought, I'm, I'm being really big seven times. I'll bet I impressed the Lord. And the Lord said, oh, no, Peter, not seven times. But 70 times 7. You know, if you're Peter, not only are you thinking, oh, I thought I was being magnanimous, and you're a little embarrassed, you're thinking, you got to be kidding me. 70 times 7. Now, he's not actually saying 490 times. He's actually moving it away from a number and saying, Peter, just walk with a spirit of forgiveness. Just, you know. In, in fact, here's what I've learned to do. So I don't have to forgive you, I refuse to be offended. Now, every once in a while, I'll still get offended, and I have to forgive. But most of the time, 
I do what Jesus said when he said, take no offense. I found out it's easier just to not take it and get offended at it in the first place than to have to, than to get offended and then have to forgive it. Right? So everybody say, be forgiving. Yeah. It's amazing how. Well, they've just done so much. Well, you're supposed to be, you're supposed to forgive others, your spouse, even as God has forgiven you in Christ. How much has he forgiven you of? When you get there, then say, I've done enough. Until you get there, shut your mouth and forgive. <laughs> Amen. Everybody say, be forgiving. All right, the next one is this, real quickly. The next one is be strong. Now is not the time to be weak. I think it's very easy when we start going through difficult times to start feeling sorry for ourselves and to give place to weakness. And everybody in this room at some time or another has been tempted to give in to the weakness. Just, I'm, I'm just so sick of this and just to give in and to be weak. The first thing God told Joshua when he got ready to go in and possess the promised land was, and he told him this three times, be strong and very courageous. Do you know why he told him that three times, not one time, three times? Because he knew the moment Joshua started going into the promised land, he was going to face problem after problem, giant after giant. We're in a pandemic. We're facing problem after problem. Here's what the Lord would say to you right now. Be strong and of a good courage. Whenever you feel like it's so much, be strong. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Come on. Do like Joel said. When you feel weak, say, I'm strong. I love it. Say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen. Can I tell you there are people you view yourself as a weak person? Stop viewing it. You're not a weak person. You've just chosen to be weak. You, that's just what you've succumbed to. That's, what you, that's how you've seen yourself. You're not weak. If you have Christ in you, listen to me. You have the potential. You have the ability to be strong. You have God's strength available to you. I don't care who you are. You can be strong even when you're going through a pandemic. The next one is be flexible. <laughs> Rigid people have a hard time making it through long seasons of challenges. And we all have to be flexible. The word flexible means the ability to make changes, to change directions easily, to compromise when appropriate. It means being capable of being bent without breaking, adaptable, willing to yield, pliable. Can I tell you, as a church, we had to be flexible when this pandemic kept because it took us out of what we normally did, and we had to make all these changes. And I'm thank, I thank God I've got one of our values as a team is that we, flex, we are flexible. We flexicute. You know why? Because life happens. And I'm not going to be rigid. Well, we always, we always, we, I don't care what we always do. We're not doing it now. We can't do it now. We got to change. We got to roll with what's happening. We're not going to let it get the best of us and our rigidity. We're going to adapt to the change. Come on. We're going to be flexible. We're going to rise to the occasion. We can do this. We can get through this. Amen. Can I tell you who are the most, the most inflexible people? Our controlling people. Controlling people want to control everything, so they, have, they tend to be the least flexible. Can I tell you what you're in control of in life? Nothing but you. And you have a hard time controlling you. I know. I've watched. <laughs> so stop trying to control the rest of us and everything else around us. Do us a favor. Flex a bit. Bend a little. Blessed are the flexible, for they shall not get bent out of shape. Last but not least, and this is, and I'll close, be changed. Be changed. Remember, I talked about having a marriage that thrives in difficult times. You want to have a marriage that thrives in difficult times? As much as anything else I've said to you, be mindful of the changes that God may be endeavoring to work in you through this season. If you're an angry person, I'll bet he's dealing with your anger. If you're a person who's kind of focused on yourself and you're getting frustrated right now. I bet he's trying to work on you being so focused on yourself all the time. Come on. Whatever, wherever it is that you're weak, God moves in challenging times.
to work good things into us. Joshua, God gave, not Joshua, God gave Joseph a dream of ruling. And he didn't go from a dream to ruling. He went from a dream to being in a pit, to being a slave in Potiphar's house, to being thrown into a prison. You know what God was doing through all that? The Bible actually tells you that God was taking him through all those things to build character into him so that he had the ability to reign when the opportunity arose. And he used one bad thing after the next to work good things into Joseph. You know what God wants to do right now? You know, I don't know why God is letting me go through. Why is it? You know, okay, well, listen. The enemy's trying to take advantage of it too. Recognize that. But God's up to good stuff right now. He's endeavoring to do a good work in you. So when you come out of this, you don't just survive, you thrive in a difficult time. Did you get a hang out of this today? Amen. I hope you did.